Do you remember the TV show, America's Funniest Home Videos? You know, that was, that was before YouTube. Now you can watch fail videos anytime you want. Do you need help? enjoy Evie's guest appearance in those fail videos. She laughs at it too, so it's all right. You know, we laugh at that stuff, but failure isn't usually funny. When a high-profile Christian leader fails, it's big news. We've seen it too often, from Jerry Falwell to Carl Lentz, Israel Houghton, Houghton, why I can't say his name, I don't know. That's my fail video. Bill Hybels. People watch and speculate why it happened. Many claim they saw it coming, although that's pretty easy to say after the fact. Some pile on and say, well, he deserved it. Still others seem to celebrate the consequences, which is a sad reaction to failure. Whether well-known or unknown, when someone fails, there are always consequences. Marriages are wrecked. Families are torn apart. Ministries are destroyed. Hearts are broken. Sometime back, I received an email from someone who's new to our church. Before coming to First NLR, he really messed up. Mistakes and sin. And I asked his permission to share a few lines of the email with you. Here's what he wrote. Although I know what the word of God says about forgiveness, I don't feel forgiven. Will I ever feel forgiven? Or is it a matter of faith in that I just have to believe I'm forgiven? I know that people will never forgive me and will always remind me or be reminded of what I did. But I need to know that God has forgiven me. He's not taking his hand off me or my life. He still has a purpose for me to fulfill in his kingdom. And then this one line near the end of the email broke my heart. I will understand if you would rather I attend somewhere else. I was burdened for the sender. My heart hurt for a friend who had to ask if he could be forgiven and if God still had a purpose, if he could be restored, and even if he could attend church. And maybe you wonder the same thing. You messed up big time. Your sins are many or big. Your failure cost much. You've paid a horrible price. And like my friend, you're asking, is there hope for me? Does God have a plan for me? Do I have a place in his church? Am I welcome in this church? Over the years, I've witnessed the destruction of careers, ministries, homes, marriage, families, and futures because of devastating sin and failure. I've had incredibly difficult meetings with people whose worlds have fallen apart because of their own sin or mistakes. I hate failure, not the people, but the effects of failure. But as much as I hate failure, that's how much I love restoration. I love watching people get back on track. I love seeing people faithfully following and fulfilling God's purpose for their lives. And looking across this room, I see a bunch of former failures who've been restored. I remember your stories, 
Some of you, I know the hurt and the pain. I remember the anger and the tears. And when I look at you now, that seems so long ago. When I, when I see you, I don't think of your failure. I see you being and doing what God designed you to be and do. And that makes me want to shout, cheer, laugh, cry, all at the same time. The pain of failure, the joy of restoration are two opposite ends of the extreme. And that's the kind of story we look at today. We've been studying and learning lessons from the life of Peter, an ordinary, common, average guy, a fisherman, whose life was radically changed by an extraordinary encounter with Jesus. One day after a long night of futile fishing, Jesus asked to use Peter's boat as a floating teaching platform. When Jesus was done teaching, he told Peter to go back out fishing again. Peter obeyed, and he got the catch of a lifetime. They caught so many fish, the boat started to sink. When they finally got ashore, Jesus gave Peter the opportunity of opportunities. He said, from now on, you will catch men. And Peter left everything behind. The fish, his nets, his boat, his business, his home. He left everything to follow Jesus. Peter was a witness to Jesus' miracles. Peter saw deaf hear, blind see, crippled walk, and diseases instantly healed. Peter was there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. Peter walked on water when Jesus came walking across a lake in the middle of the storm. Instead of the common, boring life of a fisherman, Peter lived history following Jesus. And at some point along the way, Peter realized that Jesus was more than just a prophet or a teacher. He was the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Peter was determined to follow Jesus wherever he went, no matter the price. And that's what made Peter's failure all the more devastating. We looked at it last week, but just in case you missed, I'll briefly summarize. The Last Supper, Jesus told the disciples they would all desert him, and Peter, in a moment with passion, said, not me, never. They might leave you, I won't. I'll go to prison with you, I'll die with you, I will never leave you. And Jesus looked at him and said, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. This very night, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. To which Peter said, you're wrong, no way, not me. Then later that night, Jesus was arrested. Peter followed at a distance, and he had three opportunities to admit he was a follower of Jesus. And all three times. Peter denied even knowing who Jesus was. Peter failed miserably. He betrayed Jesus. He walked away and didn't even admit that he knew him. It's important to note, this failure came after Peter committed Jesus, after he learned Jesus was not a man but the Son of God. This was not a sin before choosing to follow. This was sin and betrayal from a self-proclaimed lifelong follower. This isn't a story of salvation. This is a story of restoration. We pick up the story now in Luke chapter 22, verse 60. Just as Jesus is speaking... The rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. We don't know if Jesus overheard what Peter said. I have to think he didn't because Peter wasn't close and Peter wouldn't be yelling his denial. But somehow Jesus knew. He turned and he looked right at Peter. You know that look. Your mom is an expert at that look. That look is hurt mixed with sadness and disappointment. That look cuts to the heart. Peter got the look from Jesus. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You'll disown me three times. From I'll die with you to I don't know you, Peter was a traitor and a colossal failure. Sadly, Peter didn't drop everything to run to Jesus. 
He didn't shout, forget it, I didn't mean it. I'm with him. I'm his follower. Take me. If you're going to kill him, you'll kill me. Jesus, I love you. I'll die with you. That's what should have happened. Instead, he went outside and he wept bitterly. Peter knew he failed, but he didn't make it right. It's a sad picture. A strong, opinionated, once fully committed, dedicated follower now sitting alone, crying. Now, to understand just how deep his disappointment was, I want to back you up one, one more time. Matthew 16, here's what Jesus said to Peter. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter, an average fisherman, was called the rock upon which the church would be built. And now he was alone, bitterly weeping from rock to rock, from commitment to abandonment, from follower to failure. Hard to imagine a worse failure. You wouldn't blame Jesus if he was angry and never wanted to talk to Peter again because that's how we would respond. We would say something like, you might get me once, but you won't get me twice. I will never trust you again. Now fast forward to John chapter 21. After the crucifixion, the resurrection, Peter, the failure, and a group of disciples we're back in the boat. On the same lake, fishing. And because we've been studying Peter, you recognize what a sad picture this is. From common fisherman to disciple of Jesus, and now back to an ordinary fisherman, adventure over. They were fishing. And I picture them just kind of quiet. When a guy called out to them from the shore, and when he realized that guy was Jesus, Peter couldn't wait to row in. He jumped out of the boat. He, he didn't get to walk on the water again. That was a one-time thing. He jumped out of the boat, and he swam to the shore. And when they reached shore, Jesus had a fire started. He said, Bring some of the fish you've caught, and let's have breakfast. They ate together around the fire, Jesus and his disciples, as they, as they no doubt had done many times before. And when they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then the third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him for the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus asked the same question three times. I don't think that number was a coincidence. Peter denied Jesus three times. Now Peter got three opportunities to declare his love. And Jesus continued his talk with Peter. He said, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted. When you were old, you'll stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. And you read that and say, what? Jesus explained. Jesus said this to, include the kind, to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Jesus was saying, Peter, remember you said you'd die with me and you didn't, but you will. 
You will pay the ultimate price for being my follower. Following me will cost you your life. And this time Peter didn't walk away. He clearly understood the price and he was willing to pay it. At the end of the conversation, Jesus said the words Peter thought he would never hear again. Two short words, but filled with incredible meaning to Peter. Jesus said to him, follow me. In other words, I believe you, I forgive you. Now, Peter, remember the original assignment I gave you when you were going to be my messenger and build the church? Remember when I said you were the rock upon which the church had built? You remember that? Even though you were a traitor, and even though you turned your back on me, and even though you denied me, that is still my plan for you. You are still a rock, and I'm still going to use you to build my church. And for some of you, we could stop right there. That's the message you need to hear. It is time to quit punishing yourself and dwelling on the past. Follow Jesus, and let's go. Let's move forward. It had to be breathtaking. Now, if I was Jesus, I'm not sure I'd have done it that way. Peter didn't deserve a place of leadership. I might have said, all right, thanks, Pete. Thanks for saying you love me. Too bad you didn't say that when the pressure was on. Too bad you didn't say that was when I was being beaten and ridiculed. It's pretty easy to say now, now that I'm back to life, isn't it? Nice little show jumping out of the boat and swimming to see me. But uh, I just got to tell you, that didn't impress me one bit. Get out of here. You're useless. You say, come on, Rod. Jesus wouldn't be like that. Not Jesus. You're right. Jesus wouldn't be like that. He loved Peter, and he forgave him for the ultimate betrayal. We understand that story, and we marvel at the love of Jesus. But somehow there is a disconnect. You believe he forgave Peter like that. But you have trouble believing he can forgive you like that. You're happy for Peter, but still struggle to accept it for yourself. After all, look what I've done. I messed up big time more than once. My sins are big. I've done some really, really bad things. People know about it. There's no way... God could forgive and restore me. Peter was a traitor who turned his back on Jesus at the ultimate moment in all history. But if, instead of encountering an angry, correcting Jesus, Peter found a loving, accepting Jesus, ready to forgive and use him. It's really an amazing story of restoration and forgiveness and grace. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received Take me back, take me back, dear Lord, where I first believed. Take me back, oh yeah, take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received. Take me back, take me back, dear Lord, where I first believed. I feel that I'm so far from you, Lord, but still I hear you. simple things that I once knew the memories are drawing me I must confess Lord I've been so blessed 
but still my soul isn't satisfied. So renew my faith, restore my joy. Lord, won't you dry my weeping eyes? Oh, I just want to go back. Take me back. Take If we claim to be followers of Jesus, then this is how we must treat people who fall and fail. Paul wrote in Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself or you may also be tempted carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. If you claim to be spiritual, then forgiveness and restoration is your only option. And when you lovingly, gently lead someone to restoration, you fulfill the law of Christ. If you don't respond that way to failure, then you don't fulfill the law of Christ. You violate God's law. You sin and you demonstrate that you are not spiritual. You say, Rod, that's harsh. Well, that's not me talking. That's right out of the Bible. Look it up for yourself. It's there. I want to speak to two kinds of people today. To those who have failed and to those who have not. If you have not failed, scripturally, your assignment is to be a spiritual, loving, gentle restore. That's how we must respond to failure. We must offer restoration and grace. Now, that doesn't mean you rescue people from consequences. It, it means you recognize your role and God's role are entirely different. Your job is to love your neighbors yourself. God's job is transformation. So resist the impulse to pile guilt and shame on someone who's messed up, and instead, Trust that God, the author and finisher of our faith, will continue his good work in them. He's able. One of the really special things about First NLR is it's a healthy place for people to heal. 
Many people, many ministers come here for a season to be restored. We're a way station, a place to heal before getting back to God's plan and purpose for their life. It is an honor to be part of that restoration process. Together, we fulfill the law of Christ. Guess what? Failures are welcome here. Because failures are welcome with Jesus. We will not turn people away because of their many sins, their big sins, their ugly sins, or their public sins. There's a second kind of person I'm talking to today. If you failed, I want you to listen close. Because there's one more piece of this story that's even more amazing to me. Fast forward again. Acts chapter 2. When Jesus left this earth, he, he told his disciples to wait in the upper room for the Holy Spirit. The disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. There was this loud uh, celebration of worship that got the attention of people. A huge crowd gathered hundreds of people to see what was happening. And one disciple stepped out. And begin to preach the sermon that started the first church. Here's what he preached. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off. For all, all who call on the name of the Lord. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourself from the corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day. 3,000 people became followers of Jesus, and the guy who preached that sermon was Peter. Isn't that incredible? The same guy who denied Jesus in the ultimate moment of history had the honor to stand and proclaim Jesus' name. It is an awesome picture of forgiveness and grace. Listen to me. If you failed, you can be forgiven. God still has a plan for your life. He still loves you. He will use you. He's got a place for you, and we've got a place for you. My reply to my friend's email was probably the longest email I've ever written. Pages. I get hundreds of emails every day, so generally my replies are short. Sometimes people get mad. I wrote you a whole page, and you only wrote back a paragraph. You should see how many pages I've read today. This one wasn't short. I won't read the whole thing. I just want to read you the end of my email. Me, my family, and our church family will treat you as scripture instructs, gently and with love. We will welcome you as part of our family, and we will love you as one of our own. We recognize that many of us have sins and mistakes in our past, and we rejoice in a Savior who restores in a church family where loving restoration is practiced. You are welcome at First NLR. And I'm praying you fully realize the immenseness of his grace. You might be watching online today. And the thought of walking back in a church fills you with fear. Because you're afraid everybody knows. Everybody knows about your failure. Maybe a lot of people do. I don't know. I have a word from the Lord for you today. Listen to me. You're sitting there wondering if you ever will be able to make it back. If you'll ever be able to minister again. If you'll ever be able to sing again. If God will ever use you again. If you'll ever lead a church again. Listen to me. God still has a plan and purpose for your life. God still has the same plan and purpose for your life. He still has an assignment for you. If he would restore Peter, who denied him at the cross, then he will restore you. And it is, it is time for you 
to walk out of that cave of depression. And it is time for you to say, Lord, I will receive your restoration and healing. And it is time for you to receive that in a healthy church with a church family who will love you and restore you. And you say, well, where am I going to find that? You are welcome here. Failures are welcome here. You say, well, I don't live anywhere near here. You email me. I'll, I'll put my email address on the screen, a matter of fact. You email me, and I'll help you find a church that will love you and will help you walk towards restoration. There is hope for you. There is hope for your future. Maybe you've never been in ministry, but you've messed up. And you feel like a failure, and you just wonder, is there a chance? Yeah. That's simply my answer. Yes, there is. That's the wonderful thing about Jesus. He just keeps loving you and forgiving. There is a way back. Peter jumped out of the boat and swam to Jesus. I'm not suggesting you swim. But maybe you need to get out of bed and get in your car and drive to a church. Or maybe you need to walk down an aisle to the front and kneel and say, Lord, here I am. Or maybe you just need to quietly whisper a prayer. Jesus, I'm ready. I want to pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for a remarkable story of forgiveness, restoration, and love. Lord, we can't even, we can't even understand or comprehend that level of forgiveness and that level of love, but we are so grateful for it. If you can forgive Peter, you can forgive us. If you can restore Peter, then we can be restored. If you still had a plan and purpose for Peter, then you still have a plan and purpose for me. And I pray right now, Lord, for failures. I pray for people who have failed in little ways that no one else knows, that right now they would accept your love and your grace and your forgiveness. And I pray for people who have had big, hairy failures that everybody knows. Lord, that they would, in the story of your love for Peter, recognize your love for them and they would begin the road back back to you back to your plan back to your purpose Lord we thank you that you never quit you never give up where people walk away and people give up you never do and we celebrate and we rejoice in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Come on, right now where you're at, I just want you to receive his love and respond to his grace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Now I want you to celebrate with what I believe the Lord would say to you. Come on, hear it.
man. But the love of God looked down on men and said, I'll give him another chance. Oh, thank God. you to just sing Welcome Home one more time before she does. Uh, her music's great. And there's a table out there. I recommend this one, Anthem and Hymns. It's just, 
you're going to love it. I'd give it to you, but then I wouldn't have it. I will keep it for myself. Come on, stand up and raise your hands to Jesus and receive this. Sing just welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. is full 